Hey guys, it's Ben and Rachel from Onsite Firearms Training, and today we're here to talk about how to prepare and get into your first training class. This is my first class, my first time going in. What are some recommendations? What are some things that I need to bring? What are some things I should be looking for? Uh, these are the things that we're going to be going over today to give you a little bit of a better idea as to which direction to go in your training as either a hobby or if this is something you need to do for work, we'll address that as well. There are instructors out there that teach high speed advanced classes and that's their specialty, that's what they're known for. If you're not ready for a class with that instructor, uh, I would work my way up to that instructor, start with some local guys, start with some other people that have good reputations, and then maybe ask them, hey, I really enjoyed your class, can you recommend other instructors to train with? We have no problem recommending other instructors. We will never tell you who not to train with, but we will say, hey, here's a suggestion for you. It's important that you read that class description. That's really going to be the thing that lets you know whether or not that course is going to be working on a skill set that you need to work on. Uh, if you are a beginner and you hop into an advanced class, you might end up being extremely overwhelmed and you may end up dragging the rest of the class down to a slower pace. Absolutely. Number one, like that first class and that beginning aspect, everything that we're looking for is that you're safe because we can't really train you if you're not safe. And really that kind of comes from a fundamental understanding of what you're doing. So if you're missing that stuff, that's going to make everything a much, much steeper hill to climb, right? Yeah, I suggest pick a class that goes with what you're trying to accomplish. If you are a new shooter, maybe signing up for a vehicle class or a team tactics class or a shoot house class might not be your best first choice. Get involved at a level where you can kind of get all the kinks out first and then get into a serious or more focused class. So you're saying learn how to shoot first before I start learning how to shoot <laughs> inside of a car. Very important for you as students to read and actually bring is the equipment list. Yeah, it's yeah. critical. There's a reason the equipment list yeah, is listed. It's um, not a suggestion. <laughs> I've had so many people, you know, drop us an email that I've seen. It's like, oh, I saw that this was on the equipment list. Do I really need to bring this or is that just on there for, you know, whatever reason? No, if it's on the equipment list, you need to bring it. If it says you need five magazines, guess what? You, you need, need five, five magazines. magazines. <laughs> if it says you need a holster and a belt, don't show up with sweatpants and flip-flops. This yeah. has happened. Yeah. And I've just, we've turned people around and said, have a nice day. And really why we're turning people around is not because we don't like that they're not wearing that stuff. It's critical in order for you to be able to get through the class and learn the things that we're teaching. So um, some people, again, because they're new to this, are not understanding the framework or the context of what we're talking about here. But ultimately, we just need for you to trust that if you adhere to that equipment list and you come in prepared, um, you get on the other side of that class and you'll understand exactly why those things are critical elements in order for you to have a successful day. A lot of times if you're brand new, you may not have some of the things on that list. You may not know what some of the things on the list are. If that's the case, Drop your instructor or drop your range, whoever's hosting the event, drop them an email. Hey, uh, it says here I need such and such piece of equipment. I don't have that. Does anybody know where I can either get it, uh, where I can either buy it, or maybe borrow or rent it? Sometimes that's an option for different facilities and different instructors. Yeah, I mean, it's not unheard of, especially if an instructor is working with either a manufacturer or an aftermarket company that they have some um, of the guns of whatever platform that they're teaching that day available for you to try out, for you to run that day, um, obviously follow all your state's laws, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But ultimately, if you're missing something, you don't have to stew on it, you don't have to wring your hands about it. We are always there to provide either an avenue for you to go purchase it or potentially borrow it. I like to get there early because for me, if I'm early, that means I'm on time. If I'm on time, that means I'm, I'm a little bit late. Your time also translates to everybody else's time in the class. 
So if you're late, they are now waiting on you. The start of every class is usually the safety briefing and the first aid briefing. When we have start times, um, at least we'll speak for our classes specifically, those start times are when class begins, not when it's time for you to be getting your gear on, or time for you to be loading your bags, or time for you to be finding parking. This is when everybody's eyes and attention is on us for intros, as Ben said, safety briefs, etc., etc. And start times mean you're ready to go at that point. Dress accordingly can mean anything from showing up with the appropriate amount of outerwear on, showing up with sunscreen, showing up with rain gear. What I want you guys to understand is dress accordingly means you should probably always have either something warmer um, or something to keep you dry with you when you go and train. A lot of those indoor facilities um, that are trying to move the lead out of the air are sucking in outdoor air and they're not warming it up. So whatever the temperature is outside, it's likely to be that inside. Or very close to it. Yeah, so even though it may say it's an indoor range, if it's 40 degrees out, you should still be bringing your outdoor coat. We'll get the occasional email that we'll see. It's like, hey, what do we do if it rains this weekend? Bring your you rain bring your raincoat, because <laughs> otherwise you're going to get wet. Yeah. Or, hey, if it's cold out this weekend, are we still having class? Yeah, I'm just going to layer up with extra clothing. So, you know, when you sign up for the class is a great time to go over that equipment list, but it's also a great time to go over the gear, like the clothing gear that you have available to you. Yes. And so one of the other considerations that we do see is people are coming in with an extreme concealed carry holster. What we would prefer to see is a belt mounted holster. The amount of in and out of the holster reps that you are going to be getting in order to train that draw really require a hardy setup. It's not the time to get something that works at the beach uh, and bring it into your basic training class. I also want to scale what I wear to the class uh, according to how I live. Dress how you live. If I work in an office every day, I'm not going to come in wearing plate carriers and battle belts and camo shirts and gloves and night vision goggles and helmets and all that, right? I'm here for Pistol 101 and uh, I work in IT. Hi, I'm Todd. I'm from Passaic, New Jersey. I work in the resource distribution department at my local Staples. It is America and you can do what you like. Any of you guys are free to train however you prefer. But what we recommend is that you do train in a way that represents your life. And if your life means that you are not professionally carrying that gun on your leg, or outside the waistband on a battle belt, at least some of your classes should work how you normally dress. Train it, run it, practice it how you live it. So what do you think would be the first thing, the most important thing, that I need to put into that range bag before anything else? Coffee. No. No? First thing that I put into my range bag, and I know the first thing you put into your range bag as well, is our med kit, your IFAC, your individual first aid kit, trauma kit, whatever it is. And it's got to have a few key elements. First things first, rubber gloves, right? While blood does belong in the body, as they say, Blood also belongs to the person it belongs to and not to everybody else. I don't want anybody else's blood all over me. Second thing I need is a proper tourniquet. Whether it's a cat tourniquet or a soft tee, you have to have some way to stop the bleeding in case there is any sort of traumatic injury. How do I get training on tourniquet application? Go to the instructor that you are going to be getting into the class with and ask them for recommendations. There are some fantastic companies out there that will be able to get you trained in either one, two day classes. And there's also a fantastic program that's happening throughout the country called Stop the Bleed. Those are free. While they're a dip in a bucket, um, it's still better to have some training than none training. Yep. Learn how to patch yourself and patch up others that you care about. 
before we start running and gunning like ninjas. I'm yeah. going to a firearms class. Yeah. I should probably bring my own gun. <laughs> so for today, we're mostly going to talk about pistol courses. Again, one of those things that we see happen quite a bit is the communication is essentially, I want something to conceal uh, and not to shoot. And they end up with real small guns. Tiny um, guns, see? Tiny guns. Yeah. Right there. Right there. Where? Oh, wow. Right there. Yeah, teeny tiny. It's a 40 cal, too. Yeah. Um, so, <sighs> listen, we get it. If that's the only firearm that you have to bring to class, um, so be it. But ultimately, you'd want to have something that's got a four inch barrel plus to really get real learning in play. People ask us, hey, you know, what, what, should, what should I get for my first gun? Uh, something mid-size, SIG 320, Glock 19, Glock 17, Smith & Wesson M&P, uh, something along those lines. What caliber? 9mm. Um, I would suggest just learning how to shoot before we start getting into the, the extreme cool guns. What? Uh, get something that you can get a good purchase on, a good grip on. And that is where you will find the best results for your learning experience. Right, so um, a lot of things that people get misconstrued is, well, if I'm comfortable carrying it or it's easy for me to conceal, it's a success. And really, what you should have is something that you can accurately and dependably and reliably uh, place the shots where you have wanted them to go. Accountability is critical in concealed carry. So if you cannot be accurate with that firearm and you cannot comfortably operate that firearm, then it's not an appropriate firearm for you. How many guns should I bring to a class? So I have about maybe, let's say I've got five really awesome guns and I love all of them and I don't know which one to shoot. Which one should I bring? Well, we prefer you to pick one to train with, especially if it's at the beginning of your shooting career. Um, if you do have mm, two of about the same size firearms, it's wise to bring a backup gun only because things happen. Um, guns don't break. Yeah, guns don't break. We've seen it all. Um, there is really no firearm that um, is going to have perfection 100% of the time. If you do have multiple firearms, bring that second firearm as a backup. If you don't, that's okay. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you've got access to a second or a backup, um, that always provides you at least a few more hours of training if your primary goes down for some reason that we can't repair easily on the range. Essentially, this goes for every class, whether it's still shotgun trans, or still rifle. Still translates over. If you're coming into a shotgun class, uh, I'd recommend bringing both the semi-auto if you have one and bringing the pump. Some people will say, well, I have a pump shotgun, but I want to bring my semi-auto. What should I do? And I'll tell them, bring both. Get some reps in on both. Learn how to use both guns, right? If you own both, you should know how to run both. The next thing that we want to talk about is your belts. And people may feel like, what? A belt? Like, I'm just going to bring a belt. What's the big deal? Yeah, and there's One belt's the same as the other, <laughs> yeah. right? But what we have found is uh, oftentimes people will have holsters and they've got some pretty substantial loop openings. Those loops may be a 1.75 inch belt loop opening. And then they've got the one and a half inch mm -hmm. wide belt. There's a lot of movement with your holster. And what that does is it kind of creates a lack of confidence going in and out of the holster for you. So it's critical for you to understand that your belt is important, probably more important than you're thinking. Whether you've got something like a reinforced belt. That's a lot of belts. It is a lot of belts. Why do you have so many belts? Oh, well, you know, sidebar on all of this is you're probably gonna accumulate a fair amount of gear because what may work for your friend may not work for you. One of the things that you'll see here, this is a reinforced gun belt. Both of these are manufactured by Mean Gene Leather and he's got some really nice leather belts out there. The amount of thickness that you see here and um, this is actually not necessarily as reinforced as you might find out there in the past. The reason why there's a little bit more flexibility with a lot of these belts is um, again, our holster technology has actually made some pretty substantial leaps and bounds. And most people are carrying either a hybrid or a complete Kydex style holster. And the belt isn't needed to provide 
as much stiffness as it has in the past. This so, still looks a lot thicker and a lot stronger than belts that you can just buy at Target or Walmart or, yeah, and, or any other sort of department store. So, and the other thing to understand is the reason why there's so much thickness and reinforcement in a gun belt versus a regular belt is these guys you don't have to quite cinch as hard across your body because again, they're providing a lot of the support for the holster as opposed to just ratcheting something into your body. Obviously these should be snug. You want to minimize as much movement with your holsters as possible. Um, but if you do have a strong side carry um, uh, holster, these are a pretty solid option if they are outside the waistband holsters. Inside the waistband holsters, one of the things that you want to be careful of is that the attachment materials do actually get around the thickness of these belts. Sometimes the clips, they can't reach around these guys, and what they do is they sit just outside of reaching underneath, and all that means is when you draw that pistol out, the holster comes with it. It's important for you to get your belt and your holster well enough in advance of your class so that you can try them out in your house and see that everything is in tip-top working shape. Absolutely. Depending on the attachments, and we're going to get to holsters in just a few minutes, a less reinforced belt may be an option. Um, this company, Graith, uh, just folded, but one of the other companies that is also producing another really nice nylon belt is Wilderness Tactical. One of the cool things about this belt is it does not have a substantial buckle, which means I can put this on and then put my gear on if I've forgotten something, or you know, I can put this on and it's easier for me to get things like my mag carriers and my holster on. I'm a lady, so I have to break my belt down when I use the ladies room. So uh, things like that are more important for me. So the belts that I choose are based off of my appendix inside the waistband carry, which surprise, surprise, that's how I train. And so I've chosen a belt for success with that style of carrying. Our favorite topic. It is. It is Our a constant. favorite topic. We're going to get the negative out of the way first. Um, we both like to be as positive as possible. Um, we like to focus on the positive, but... Sometimes it's fun to get in on that negative. The biggest issue that we have found with unsupported leather, which means this is unsupported. It's not staying open by itself, whether it's an inside the waistband or it's an outside the waistband under pressure on your body, the holster will collapse. And by collapse, we mean close. And when the holster collapses, it's oftentimes when people start digging around with their muzzles or digging around with their hands to get the holster opened in conjunction with their muzzle and it becomes a major safety hazard. These are great when they're new, because when they're new, they still hold their form. But over the course of months, years of use, again, as Rachel said, they're not really too well supported, so they collapse. As I've said before, as we both said in classes, if you cannot draw your pistol out and return to the holster without using the support hand, what do you do with this holster? Throw it out. Get rid of it, it's garbage. So in the supported variety of holsters, or holsters that are molded and they don't collapse, something that we don't wish to see is the Serpa holster. We know that it's kind of a hot button issue still on the internet, but ultimately we feel like there are too many issues with this holster to have any of our, especially our new students, come in with these holsters. People who don't have enough reps on them end up pressing their hands into their trigger guard as they release their firearm out of this holster. The other thing is these tabs can break off and then they can start to uh, wedge themselves inward. What Rachel's talking about is when we're in, it's got great retention, but in a hasty situation, I have to depress this lock. Finger comes right up and goes right into the trigger guard in right on the trigger. The argument is, oh, if you train with it, that'll never happen. If you train with it, you train to keep that finger up on the slide when it comes out. That's great. I understand the argument. Everyone's an expert, but under stress, under continual reps, just the slight opportunity, the slight chance that you can come to here and people have, that is a no-no for us. 
listen, at the end of the day, there are way, way too many other options out there with retention, if retention is critical to you. Two other issues, like Rachel was saying, uh, there's a great video out there by our pal Craig Douglas where they are doing some force on force with simulation guns. They're rolling around on the ground. Some dirt and gravel get stuck inside this little locking mechanism and the gun is stuck inside the holster. No matter how hard they press it, whatever, they actually have to cut the holster in order to get the gun out. The other thing that we've seen is this lock actually breaks, and I think you just mentioned this, that little tab will fall inside the holster, and when you go to reholster, your trigger now hits that little tab, and when you come down into the holster, the gun fires. So again, the Serpa holster, what do we do with it? We chuck it. Get rid of it. It's garbage. All right, so now that we're done with all those negatives, uh, let's talk sometimes. about some rainbows and kitten stuff. Um, we're going to talk about some awesome holsters. We have a pretty good variety of holsters here. Uh, if you haven't seen it, Ben did a fantastic holster review. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about um, first with holsters that we do like is we like to see some Kydex holsters, holsters that don't collapse, right? We went over why. Another thing that we see quite often is if the holster is easy to get onto your body, it's easy to get off your body. It should be kind of a pain in the butt to get your holster secured because it means it's not going to pop right off when you don't want it to. The actual attachments that you know we find to be ideal are either a closed loop, a pull towards snap, and there's also a company called Discreet Carry Concepts that have these spring steel clips that have an alternate direction piece at the bottom that really hold on to any kind of belt. Almost now, like a locking system. Yeah, and so they're kind of like an upwards claw. One of the things to understand with this is that you should be sure that that upwards claw piece is actually under your belt. Now, I was talking before about thicker belts. The thinner belt that I had showed before, that nylon belt, was the one that works really well with this. The thicker belt, these claws are not wide enough to get under. And while we both have our favorite holster companies, uh, there are some that we agree on, there are some that Rachel likes specifically, there are some that I like specifically. Uh, my four favorites for holster companies, C&G Holsters, fantastic stuff, cngholsters.com or cngarms.com, uh, Dark Star Gear, darkstargear.com, great holsters, I love the inside the waistband appendix holsters. For my outside the waistband holsters, my belt mounted strong side holster, uh, from day one, Black Point Tactical, the leather wing is still my all-time favorite holster for carrying outside of the waistband. It's got great retention. The leather wing sort of contours to the body when I tighten that belt down. This is still one of my favorite outside the waistband holsters. Uh, and as far as my other inside the waistband appendix holsters, apart from Dark Star, uh, CNG holsters is a newer company we're working with called Concealment Express. Again, fantastic holster, excellent slim line uh, design, great attachments for your belt, and excellent retention. So that gun isn't going anywhere if you need to roll around on the ground with it. Now, whether you should be working with an outside the waistband style holster or an inside the waistband style holster, such as something like this Tenacore Velo, what your goals are for your class, how you're gonna be carrying, if you have a permit to carry, that really is up to you. Um, so these are some great holsters to work with. And for a side note, for our classes, we have tons of holsters you guys can borrow, and we also have tons of holsters by some of these various companies that we have for sale. We don't have your particular model. We do have discount codes that you can use for a lot of these companies to get 10, 15% off of these holsters when you order online. Magazines and magazine carriers. Okay. And do we have any mag carriers here? <laughs> I, I so right, let's get oh, wait. these holsters out of the way. What are we putting in these mag carriers? We're, we're putting, we're putting, hopefully, 
more than just the one or two magazines that you got with your gun. How many mags should I bring to a class? Five is a really good number. Now, if you're brand new to shooting, you're probably thinking like, my God, why do I need so many mags? Seriously. If you've been shooting for a while, you're probably like, those are rookie numbers. You got to up those numbers. So <laughs> so an ammo can yeah. filled with loaded mags is yeah. probably a good idea. What you got to understand is you're going to move through ammunition pretty quickly. If you have multiple magazines available with you on your body while you're on that line, it just means you get to train that much more. It means that you're loading magazines less. So the amount of time that you're actually learning is that much greater. A lot of people who are brand new to shooting just don't know that because you get more out of the class the more magazines you have. When you arrive to the class with two or three magazines, you now have to reload those mags after you've gone through two or two three or mags, three. which could be a single a, yeah, drill, frankly. One single drill. So now every drill you're running back to load mags, which cuts into your time. Mm -hmm. And if you are an integral part of the drill for the line, you're cutting into everybody else's time. So while it does seem a little excessive to say bring at least five mags, 20 is good, uh, 30 is probably even better. Yeah, they are expensive. They can be about 20 to 40 bucks depending on what kind of gun you got. Mm -hmm. However, it will enhance your experience. The more mags you have, the better. And please, do everyone a huge favor. Arrive to the class with all of your mags, with the exception of one, already loaded. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. coming into class, mags loaded, lots of mags, lots of loaded mags. Fantastic. Yeah, and so, and just like a quick sidebar, there are a pretty good variety of aftermarket magazines out there that I would say you can try out in a training environment. I, again, when you're trying to maybe redistribute some of your money around and devote some of that more towards either the training costs or the ammo costs, uh, average Glock 19 magazine can hover around about 21 to 1999, depending on the store. 30 your mag poles, yeah. Your Magpul um, magazines will float anywhere around $9.99, so there are ways to make it work. So, so now I've got all these mags, yeah. I need to have a way to carry them or house them somewhere on my person so that I can easily access them. I'm not wearing a giant plate carrier with all kinds of little mag pouches, so what options do I have if I want to run it nice and slick and clean? So we've definitely seen people come in without magazine carriers because they don't have them in their kit and that's the way that they roll. You're generally going to have more success in speed with reloading if your magazines are held stationary in a location that you're able to move to and from that's consistent. So 100%. we recommend that you get magazine carriers. Whether they're set up for your concealed carry kit or they're an outside the waistband kit just for a training environment, as I said before, it may not be that you're gonna carry 17 mags on you, but if you've got a bunch of mags up on the line, it allows you to train more. Same thing goes for mag carriers. They don't always have to be the concealed carry kit. You can uh, go outside the bounds a little bit on that. Um, I carry these guys in my kit with me. It's a pretty basic setup. This is compact stuff. It's bomb proof for the most part, it's heavy duty. I don't use them as a concealed carry option, but I don these when I'm in a training environment so that I continue to have a source of ammunition in a consistent place for me. My concealed carry is a Filster, and this I find to be really low pro, pretty easy. It's got a variable retention with this elastic cord on there. It's a loop closure. One of the things that Ben has here is a different orientation as well. Yeah. They don't always have to be carried vertical, right? No. I do carry one vertical. I do like the Dark Star Gear Koala for my inside the waistband centerline vertical. Uh, but if you are a manly man, shall we say, that's got a little bit of manliness to you, uh, you'll notice that the vertical magazines really start to suck when you need to bend down and pick stuff up or you need to go into a kneeling position or whatever. So I constantly get people asking me, hey, is that a vertical mag carrier you have? A vertical mag holder on your belt? And I say, yes, it is. Loops onto my belt, mag goes in, 
I can orient the mag facing back or I can simply turn it over and face the mag going towards the right. This is a company called Mag Holder LLC and they make horizontal belt mounted mag carriers and this is fantastic. This is a great option if you need to really conceal that magazine without it sticking up through your shirt or you are a gentleman who is a uh, gentleman of size and those magazines otherwise stick you in the gut whenever you try to bend down to, to pick something up. So we're going to get into the PPE, the personal protective gear, the equipment that is going to keep your eyes and your ears safe. We're dealing with a little bit of the Rona. Maybe you want to include this in your kit, but ultimately, oh, yeah, what we're first, yeah, we're first going to talk about is ears. Oh, there we go. As they're conventionally called. So ear pro is no joke. You should not be cheaping out on your ear pro. Frankly, you shouldn't be cheaping out on your eye pro either. We are out on the range on a high frequency basis. So we're constantly there. It was worth it for us to invest in a pair of MSA Swordens. These guys are waterproof. They are not inexpensive. But as the years have gone past, there are a lot of manufacturers that have started to jump on the electronic ear pro train and produce them for a far less expensive price. So if you're looking into this, whether they're the options that are available from 3M or they are the options available from Blockers, is also another good company. Um, but yeah, so Peltors and MSA Swordens are gonna cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $250 to $300 plus. Do worth you, every penny. Do you have to? No. Is it worth it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you go into any of your, how shall we call it, larger department stores that sell everything, but you will see other forms of ear pro from anywhere from $10 to $30. They are priced accordingly. Yes, you can go get ear pro for 20 bucks at your local big box store and guess what you've got? You've got $20 car tires on your Mercedes. The reason why electronic is preferred is because you are in a group shooting environment and as instructors we want to make sure that you guys can hear us. As opposed to just a passive ear pro which does block sound, it also blocks the voice of whoever is calling out those range commands. For me personally, I really dig the gel caps and one of the reasons I like the gel ear caps is it's very comfortable, but when I'm wearing my eye pro with other ear pro that have the harder plastic or harder rubber, it will press into my ears or press into the head. The cool thing about the gel is the gel actually forms around the arms of the eye pro and I can wear this all day without feeling that pressure from the arms of the eye pro pushing into my head. And so, when you're very at, cool. yeah, when you're at one of these training classes, you're there often for eight hours at a time. This is not your average hour at a public range session. So things like that do come into play. Do I look more intelligent with these on? No comment. One of the questions that we get a lot of the times, especially if you have prescription eyeglasses, hey, can I just wear my eyeglasses? The reason why we don't recommend you simply coming into class with your regular prescription glasses is if they are not shatterproof or they're not rated at a ballistic level, it's very possible that something catastrophic could happen. So we recommend that you follow those guidelines for a reason. It is for your safety. But uh, if you're like me and you can't hold on to sunglasses for more than, you know, three months, they just disappear, you break them, you sit on them, you smash them, you shoot them, you run them over with the car. Uh, evaluate your weak points and purchase accordingly. One thing also too to mention that what we prefer is clears. And if you have sensitivity to sun and you want to get something like transition lenses, they are available for Rudy Project Eyewear. Um, there are a few options out there that will allow you sun protection. Remove the idea of the 1970s yellow. Uh, the Amber vision. Yeah, I don't, yeah, ooh, there's some weird <laughs> stuff out there. 1995. <laughs> 
but Rudy Gear, Smith, who else out there? Wiley X is still out there doing some good stuff. So there's some big brands out there that do have those transition lenses available for them. And if you have questions, ask us. Oakley's got some good ballistic stuff too. Oakley is a big name in ballistic eye pro. Again, investing you get what you pay for. in your own health and safety is Absolutely. a smart decision. 100%. So next up on the list. Here's another question that we get from people. Are knee pads really necessary? All the jokes aside. No, jokes. <laughs> jokes all day. <laughs> knee pads. They're not just for making money behind the berm. You have to also take into consideration the environment. The environment. Are we on a gravel range? Are we on a paved range that has shell casings everywhere? If you need the additional support or the additional protection of knee pads for your training scenario, Take it. Great little addition to your range kit is some knee pads and if you're running carbine or shotgun or pistol where you're going to go prone, maybe some elbow pads as well. You should be able to move in them, uh, but they don't necessarily need to be from a tactical store or any of those things. You can go to your local Home Depot or Lowe's and grab some. These guys here. Uh, ones that we've been running for a long time, we highly recommend. They're called Damascus. Uh, where did I get them? I got them on eBay. They're about 25 bucks with free shipping. If you're doing this over and over and over again, all day, it makes sense to put some protection Every on day. your knees. Yep. What do you have there? I got tools. <gasps> nice. And if something can break, it will. And one of the best things you can do is come to class prepared for things like that to happen. When you're running hundreds of rounds a day, depending on the class. Hundreds, <laughs> up those numbers, <laughs> thousands. It's not improbable that things are gonna come loose uh, or certain things are, are gonna start to shift, twist, torque, any of that. So it's a good idea to get yourself into a scenario where you come to class with I run Glocks, a Glock tool, I have optics, I have holsters, so I take one of these little kits with me so that I can access whichever Allen key I need to, and it's compressed and small so it's easy for me to carry. Another really cool item is a multi-tool, whether it's your standard stuff that you find in stores or the real Gucci stuff like Multitasker. It's a fancy one. It's really fancy. These are beautiful pieces of tools um, and one of the things that you will find about these is that they really are a multitasker. Um, they can do things like deal with some basic wrench work, um, whether that's, you know, that kind of wrench or a castle nut wrench. What? Yeah, no I know. So all kinds of cool options on nice. here and they're all relevant to your training environment. They come with a variety of different hex heads, uh, star heads, Phillips heads, small and large. While this is not your average multi-tool, are you doing something average? No. Much the same way that you might have a spare tire and a kit to get your car jacked up to install that spare tire. These are the types of tools that you want to have around so that you can get back in and train as fast as possible when something goes down. So what I like to have uh, with me in my range bag is a toolkit that is specific to the firearm that I'm bringing with me. And this is my little Glock pouch. And I've got some different jeweler's files. Um, also, extra recoil assembly. Always good to have for your either Gen 4, Gen 5, Gen 3s, whatever it is, or whatever other pistol that you're running. Always have an extra recoil spring, recoil assembly. Uh, that is usually one of the first things that's gonna wear out on your pistol. I also have a spare parts kit. This is my Glock spare parts kit. There is every piece for a Glock Gen 3, Gen 4, and Gen 5 in here that I may need to replace. That includes all my pins, that includes my mag release, that includes slide levers, all kinds of fun stuff. And if I need any tools specific for those parts, 
they're also in there as well. Just a little thing to have on hand. Also an extra battery for the optics. You never know when that's going to go down. One thing to know, all of this stuff is not necessarily critical for you to show up on day one with, but as you continue to train, expect that your gun is going to need maintenance and it's not always going to happen at the time that you want it to. So these are things that you should continue to think about and grow. We travel a lot. The expectation is that we're not going to have the world's most perfect bench, lighting, whatever it is. But we also don't want to carry a full-size toolkit along with everything else that we carry. So think about making sure that it's portable and compact. Another big thing that I like to bring with me is some Loctite. I'll tell you right now from experience, red Loctite, when it comes to firearms, is the new blue Loctite. Don't even bother with the blue stuff. If you're dealing with firearms, especially shotguns and pistols, we're working the red. We've got the red paste, which is like a glue stick. Mmm, it smells good. And then we've got the red liquid Loctite. Either one, they're both just as good. It all depends on what you're doing. What is it, my extractor screw on my Mossberg 500? I'm gonna use the paste. If I've got something right in front of me, easily accessible, I'll use the liquid, but Again, I'm going with the red. The polar opposite game uh, is oftentimes that you need things to move, and you need things to move with less friction. So you should have something as far as lube goes in your lube. kit. <laughs> but you should have something that makes your gun run smoother with you as well. I have had success with FP2. <laughs> I've also had success with Slip 2000. AMS oil makes a great product. I don't feel like you need to go too crazy. You can always get Mobile One. Synthetic oil is synthetic oil is synthetic oil is synthetic oil. Essentially that's all you're going to be looking for. Avoid things that are grease or thicker in consistency. What they tend to do is grab onto stuff. We've covered most of the stuff that's critical, and this is like an extra bonus element that I feel like everybody should have when they get started. This is most valuable when you get started, it doesn't mean you can't start halfway through, is getting yourself some sort of notepad and keeping it in your kit. This way you can follow yourself through the years, see where you started, record what you started at, whether those are times, for out of the holster, or particular drills that you found fascinating, notes about the firearm that you were shooting, the grain weight of the ammunition that you picked that day, your success rate, your failure rate, etc., etc. Places we went for dinner afterwards. <laughs> so Ben has a different kind of criteria that he's working with. But so this is mine, and I've had it with me for a million years. There's also some right in the rain stuff, whether it's something that's given out, like this is Viking Tactics, or something that Steve Fisher gives out or gave out. Uh, I don't know if he still has more of them, but. I think so. I think they're still giving these out. These Sentinel are great. Concepts branded notebooks. Great notebooks. They, they come with two stickers that you can put on the inside back cover and front cover that give you click data on various optics. Then it's also got some drills for pistol and for carbine. Excellent, excellent things to have in your range bag. So, speaking of bags, well, some of our first or brand new students will come with their gun case and juggle all of the rest of their gear. Plastic bags don't work from like the grocery store. We have store. seen it. We have seen it all. It doesn't mean that your first bag is going to be the same bag that you're going to be carrying around in 10 years. Certainly I've gone through a few, but this is Ben's bag. It's about the size of me. Here's the problem with big bags. You put a lot of crap in you it. You fill them. And they get real heavy. So the bigger the bag, the more stuff that goes in it, the more stuff that goes in it, the more of a pain in the butt it is to bring it around everywhere. Apart from all the stuff that's on the table, what else do I have in here? Gloves. Some gloves. Another med kit, pack timer, some ammo, hand sanitizer. Another full tool kit for rifle, carbine, and shotgun. Some waivers, some class notes. 
bottle opener. Nice. Gotta have that. Some OFT stickers. Woo! Plug, plug. Some pasties. Mm -hmm. Paint markers. Those are iPhone cords. So if you're the caller, uh, and what I mean by if you're the caller is if you get to sign that rule in the safety brief, you're responsible for making sure your phone functions all the time. So it's not a bad idea to include things like that in your range kit. Lights. We're not going to get heavy into lights in this video. It's already long enough, but not a bad idea to have some backup handheld lights. Especially if you're taking a low light class, right? Always helps to bring your lights. Quick sidebar, secret, secret, secret stuff. That's gonna get hidden on <laughs> Quick sidebar on that paint marker. When we're talking about all of those magazines, oftentimes you're not the only person that has that same magazine. It's a good idea to mark your stuff. So this is one of mine. Ugh. And it's got my initials on both sides because I need to be able to reliably pick that up in a group shooting environment yep. and everybody's magazines look the same. Um, my bag is also enormous, but being that I'm a little bit smaller, I like to have an actual backpack because for me, the single shoulder strap thing doesn't work. It it's always falls off my backpack. shoulder. Yeah. So this is a backpack. It's also not something from the firearms world. Guys, explore out there on the bags. This is actually from a camera equipment company and it allows me access while I have it laid down to everything that I need. And I can also organize everything in here according to how I prefer. Just because you're going to the range doesn't mean that bag has to come from a range environment. But what it should be is sturdy. It should be able to take a variety of weather environments. It ideally is weatherproof, or excuse me, waterproof. And it's something that works for you. I do poorly when I have three different bags from three different platform forms. I do better when everything is in a single bag and I can take this reliably without thinking about it everywhere I go. You may be different, but make sure that you get something dedicated so that you can go to the range with ease and you're not juggling your stuff. If you're not interested in getting a gigantic bag and you want something a little bit smaller, something a little bit more portable, uh, our good friends over at Tough Products and our good pal, Mr. Steve Fisher from Sentinel Concepts, have come up with this smaller range bag. Not quite as big as the one that I had before, but it is still pretty big enough to hold an assortment of training, training knives, knives in. <laughs> but the things I find in bags, right? <laughs> but this is a bag that I'll take if it's I'm size. just going to the range, mm -hmm. me by myself, I want to just do some shooting. Uh, I don't need to bring all of the class stuff with me. Let's say I just want to throw some ammo in here. I want to throw a couple guns. I want to throw some OFT brochures in case I have to promote at the, at the range. Some business cards. What do we got here? That's some cat crap. Some for cat crap, anti-fog yep. lens cleaner. For Very your optics. cool. For your optics, for your eyes, your eye pro. Shout out uh, to Big Tex. I've got some little mag pouches on either side. I've got some pouches on the inside on either side. I've got some pistol mag carriers inside as well. So it's a very versatile bag. If I don't feel like bringing that giant heavy bag, I just want something small and I don't want to have to transition back and forth all the time. Check out toughproducts.com, T-U-F-F products.com. Uh, they've got a lot of different size bags, a lot of different carriers, uh, a lot of different options for whatever you guys need. One of the last things that people tend to forget is hydration and food. Depending on the class and what they've spec'd out, it's very probable that you will not have easy access to go get food. If you bring food with you, it means you don't have to either peel stuff off or change out your ammunition, etc., etc. It means you don't have to take time away from the range. You can remain on site. You can devote that time to eating your food, maybe helping out with some of the brass cleanup, etc., etc. Plan on ideally being self-sufficient on that day. Especially if you're going to a class at a facility or at a range that you may not be familiar with the area and you say to yourself, well, we've got 45 minutes for lunch. I'll just go get something local. 
and you find out that the only place to get food is 20 minutes away. Right, so... So now you're driving 20 minutes to get it, you're waiting 20 minutes, and you're coming back. You have like two minutes to you get your two food. Two minutes to eat, or you get back <laughs> and everybody's already started and they're waiting on you, or they've started without you. That's the worst. Again, it puts a damper on your training experience. Mm -hmm. Bring yourself some lunch. Bring yourself some snacks throughout the day for when you take breaks. You can get dehydrated out in the heat. You can get dehydrated in the middle of the winter. When are you going to realize that you're dehydrated? After the fact. So grab yourself, whether it's, uh, you know, it's like Gatorade is conventionally available. Drip Drop is a fantastic option because you can pour it into any water. Really what you're looking for is something to maintain your hydration throughout the day. It becomes a safety issue. If you're not 100% up here, you're not going to be 100% here. So I know it's been long. Hopefully you've had some made snacks along the, the way thing. and made it through the whole thing. But it's all good info. You can always come back and reference this if you have this big swath of time in between training. Please send it along to your friends too. Um, but if you do have questions about anything that we've said here today, you know you can always reach us. We're always around. Yep. You can always find us through OFTLLC.us which is our website, and we've got all of our contact information available there. You can and we'll have uh, a lot of the products that we talked about, any company-specific product. We'll have it listed down below here in the uh, video description. We'll make sure that we tag everybody, and uh, anything that you need to seek out that you can't find, hit us up. So we're available on Facebook. We're available on Instagram. I think we have a Twitter account still. Somewhere. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I just never got on that. But <laughs> it's Twitter. So, yeah. So so please always reach out to us if you have any questions. But ultimately, we hope this helped, and we hope to see you on the range. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Felicia. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, that went well. Yeah. <laughs>